first I wanted to explain a bit about why we do this meeting and uh, what we want to get out of it. Um, because we've organized this meeting because degrowth has gained popularity in the last years as a, as a concept, as a movement. Uh, and for example, it's uh, also in the climate movements often brought up. Many climate activists are also uh, into this um, strain uh, of thought. And I think it's quite interesting to see that degrowth has gained popularity also in the climate movement. Myself, I've, uh, I, I'm also a climate activist, uh, so most of what I am talking about will relate to the conversations that I've had uh, with people in the climate movement and the things that I've seen there, but also yeah, uh, to my work in the housing cooperative, the bundle, and also the limitations that I see within um, the cooperative. I think it's interesting to see that degrowth has gained popularity because I think it also marks like um, um, a shift in the climate movement that um, uh, in the past put a lot of blame on consumerism, on uh, the idea that uh, we all need to consume, um, yeah, we're all to blame for the climate crisis, but that degrowth um, puts more fo focus on the economic system and um, kind of relates to this, uh, we did, system change, not climate change um, uh, strain of thought, uh, I think. Um, and there's, uh, but I think there's also a lot of tensions within degrowth, also the way we relate to it as socialists. So today we want to talk a bit about this and also uh, because Federico is, is uh, um, very much involved in, in this movement, uh, but also sees these tensions and we kind of want to use this experience as a learning experience and. We want to state that, oh, I'm not the one to represent like the socialist camp and Federico the degrowth camp, but it's kind of a learning experience and uh, we want to see what, what can be the possibilities of degrowth and also its limitations. Um, yeah, do you want to start with the... Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Lorraine. Yeah. Told me. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes, thank you, Lorraine. Um, so just, um, yes, you can yeah, hear no, me, right? Yeah. 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 So um, I work at the University of Amsterdam and uh, in, I am an environmental planner. So I study in particular uh, um, urban infrastructures and the capital that flows into cities and regions and real estate, infrastructures, <coughs> energy, waste, et cetera, et cetera, just to tell more about what I do. But recently I've been um, starting to be very, um, curious and uh, actively thinking about degrowth in, and applied to, uh, to this theme. Um, but here today, um, I would like to just give, a, if I can, a brief introduction to this term for those of who that might not know um, about it. And in particular, I would like first to focus on the history of this term because it tells us a lot about the potential of the term. So, so many of you probably are aware that the term degrowth has become very popular today, we know there are, uh, we see um, international conferences, uh, we see European Union, the European Parliament organizing beyond growth conferences. This happened also in Italy, in Austria, in France. Uh, we see politicians of all spectrum to a certain degree interested in this term. So the, the, the term degrowth is becoming quite popular. Obviously, um, the most popular voice within degrowth at the moment are the so-called ecological economics voice. Basically, these people tend to point out at the fact that uh, growth in production and consumption is not compatible with planetary boundaries. Now, this seems so obvious to most of us, but many mainstream economists think that it's not the case. They tend to say, so these economies of degrowth at the moment, they are very you know, prominently saying, look, we need to re reduce, decrease consumption and production in order to meet climate targets. Now, this is the most used argument in favor of degrowth today. This microphone goes on and off. Yeah, I think. it's yeah? very annoying, sorry. That's okay. Um, oh, this one works. Yeah. Give, give me that one. Thank you. Speaker. Yes. You to hold it very close. Okay. I basically need to eat the microphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Yes. So um, 
what I want to say is that this view, so this idea of uh, decreasing production consumption to meet climate targets, it's definitely, while being very prominent in the climate movements, in green politics, it's not the whole story, okay? It's just the tip of the iceberg of degrowth. Degrowth has a much longer history. Actually, if we look at the history of degrowth, we see three main, uh, three main uh, routes. The first route is the uh, anarchist route. So um, we see in the late 90s, especially at the time of uh, the no global movement, more and more um, social movements of anarchist affiliation quite interested in degrowth as an anti-globalization strategy. That was the time when I started to talk about degrowth. It was in Italy, the G8 in Genova. That was the time when I met degrowth for the first time. There was a movement of no global anti-globalization. Related to it, the degrowth movement was very strongly anti-imperialist. Okay, so that was a, one of the factions of degrowth in the 90s. The other roots of degrowth is the so-called libertarian or uh, socialism. Andre Gors is one of the thinkers of degrowth, uh, especially in the, you know, in the 70s and 80s. This wing of degrowth obviously comes from clearly socialist, anti-capitalist tradition, uh, but it's kind of critical of work and consumption and production. So they put light on decrease uh, reduction of production and consumption, the value of free time and care, etc., etc. And the third route, which relates to that, is the feminist route. So degrowth in the very early stages in the 80s and the 90s was strongly feminist. The reason why the feminist movement was so prominent in degrowth is that they were pointing out at the so-called work of care and social reproduction within capitalism, which under current growth economies is completely undervalued. Now, we measure the performance of an economy by looking at the GDP, so all the stuff that we sell and buy. Uh, obviously, this measure uh, is, uh, makes invisible all the work that we do every day to take care of our family, our elderly, et cetera, et cetera. So that feminist tradition was also very strong. So these three traditions, were much earlier, like 30 years earlier than the current ecological economics, CO2 reduction, consume less tradition. And I think we need to really take that back uh, straight. Uh, we need to put them back in the center. Now, as I said, a basic definition of degrowth would be a decrease of consumption and production of the economy globally. And this is important starting from all that is less necessary for the well-being of humans, and that is environmentally destructive. Now, this is very important because we're talking about a decrease in production and consumption that looks at sectors of the economy that do not bring collective value, collective well-being. The most common cited examples are private jets, SUVs, all kind of apps, all kind of shit we need to buy and sell to make our economies grow. Uh, this is how the critique usually develops. The other part of the degrowth proposal, however, is not, it's not only decreasing, it's also increasing. Increasing of what uh, we define as universal basic services that meet essential human needs, okay? So degrowth is a proposal basically of decreasing what is unnecessary and environmentally destructive and increasing services for essential needs. Housing, good food, healthcare, especially in those areas where people don't meet those needs. So when somebody says, oh, what about degrowth in the global south, in the, you know, somewhere in the poor communities? Well, that's not an issue. It's not the, th the theme of degrowth at the moment. Um, there, obviously, we need economic growth. We need a process of bringing uh, wealth to meet essential needs. So when we take this definition, so planned reduction and planned increase, obviously, all kind of questions raise. Most of the degrowth scholars would say, this is a clearly anti-capitalist project. Because capitalism, the, econ the, the, the way we organize our social relations and economy today is obviously bounded to the 
what we can call the mute compulsion to expand, okay? So if you have a system that to survive needs to expand, obviously you cannot have degrowth, the decrease of production and consumption. So in fact, this definition of decreasing production and consumption, increasing essential needs, becomes anti-capitalist at the, at the very core. Still, within the growth, we have a, not a very clear stance often about capitalism, mm -hmm. especially not how people write about it. So if you look at the writings on the growth, maybe they are very clear on that, but the way people use it, in many cases, the way people, social movements, use the term degrowth is not always so clearly anti-capitalist. Now, the question you can ask is whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. For example, Jason Ekel, I found a quote yesterday of an interview, he said, what I like about degrowth, Jason Ekel is one of the authors of this book that became viral, I guess you know him. Um, he said, what I like about degrowth is that it offers a critique of capitalism that makes sense to people who are not already anti-capitalists because it gets to the nub of what capitalism is about. So somehow here becomes clear why many of these degrowers don't engage clearly and explicitly with the anti-capitalist and revolutionary issue. They say, if we do that, we may close the debate to some people who don't identify as such anti-capitalists so by talking about growth and not about capitalism, we actually go at the core of the problem and we also expand the base of people that might appeal to it. This might seem a strategy. Now, I'm not in favor or against this at the moment. I don't want to defend this, but I want to just say what, why sometimes the growth doesn't show this anti-capitalism while it is clearly anti-capitalism. Now, um, if we talk about reduction, another interesting thing I want to say that relates to revolutionary politics is that if we look at the need to reduce consumption and production, starting from the excess, we, c we have to also take into consideration class, obviously. Why? Because we see, for example, that uh, just in Europe, to take one of the continents, 10%, the, the, the richest 10% of Europe, um, emits, in terms of uh, consumption and production, emits five times more than the bottom 50%. In, uh, in uh, uh, North Africa, Middle East, the difference is six times. In China, today, the difference is seven times. The top 10% emits seven times more CO2 than the bottom 50%. So if we, even if we take the ecological argument seriously, a reduction needs to take into consideration the different responsibilities by different classes. Now, it's not that the rich eat 1,000 more burgers than the poor. That's not, it's through their investments, okay? Through their, com their shares and their investments, which are indeed, uh, at the moment, dirty investments. So um, reduction is clearly also a class issue. And it's also clearly about a system that needs to function in a way that doesn't have this compulsion and imper imperative to grow all the time. Now, what is that system? Another quote of Hekel, in fact, says, he said something like, eco-socialism is the destination, degrowth is the way towards that destination. And now, now, this is a bit of a metaphor, but what many degrow argument argue is that yes we need a society that lives within planetary boundaries that has an economic system that doesn't have to grow in order to survive that economic system is very likely eco-socialist but to get there we need to bring back our economy within these ecological boundaries we need to decrease production and consumption and that's degrowth it's not yet eco-socialist it's more a policy of reduction now, it's a bit of a debate here, but you can see that there is a, a bit of tension there. That's why I guess we're we are here. Now, I have, a, if I can, I can a last uh, point. Another point of tension between, within degrowth and between degrowth and socialism is often about revolutionary politics. 
Okay? So some critics of degrowth say that degrowth is reformist. It's not radical enough. It's not revolutionary enough. And some degrower says, no, wait a second, we are also revolutionary. So there is a debate there. Now, what are the main point of debate uh, about this issue? There are three points. The first is the obsession of degrowth, and this is really a problem in my view, to think about the small scale and the so-called voluntary simplicity approach. The idea there is that to decrease consumption and production, we need to have a, a, a society that function with short value chains, that is convivial, that is uh, you know, living in symbiosis with nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they point out at uh, you know, people growing their own food and uh, people living in housing cooperatives. These are examples of degrowth in practice. They tend to have, so degrowth tend to have a local dimension. Now, it's not everybody, but there is this tendency to the local and to also the voluntary. Well, obviously, this is problematic from the revolutionary point of view because you can, as uh, Jody Dean said, uh, Goldman Sachs doesn't care if you grow chickens yourself. You can live in a commune and let the system go disastrous. So that's the first tension. The second tension, it relates to it, is about political autonomy. Degrowth usually celebrates convivial democracy, deliberative democracy. This is, again, very strongly the anarchist tradition of degrowth, the tendency to horizontal politics. Now, this horizontalism is often criticized from a point of view of revolutionary politics by the eco-Leninists, for example, that might argue that you know, deciding horizontally, decentered, pluriverse might not create the critical political mass to achieve and to create a wider social movement, a revolutionary movement. And there, the discussion is between those that see hierarchy as a, as a useful tool, between you know, the party, the organic intellectual, blah, 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 but, uh, and, and those that see hierarchy as a problem, the most, let's say, anarchist tradition of degrowth. That's a very clear case of conflict there. Yes. And the last, uh, it relates to it anyway, it's about really the state, the, the profile of the state in a degrowth society. So what is the role of the state, public governments versus commons, the public and commons is another tension. Anyway, I leave it here, these were the three, oh, but I'm, I'm done, these were the three tensions that I see in the debate uh, today, and I hope that we can discuss it together. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I also will talk a lot about the, the same things you've said, but maybe from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, because I do think that um, I'm going to talk mostly about the, the strain that you've mentioned that has come up in the last uh, years, because like uh, the history of me and I wasn't, uh, I didn't know that all those movements in the past were also connected to the degrowth movement. So that's also very interesting, I think. Uh, but I do think that contemporary degrowth thinkers um, start from also a similar understanding of the capitalist system, like you said, like Jason Hickel, who in his book um, begins with a re really detailed explanation of um, yeah, how the uh, capitalist system, a system that is based on growth for the sake of growth, uh, is the basis and the leading cause of the climate crisis. Um, it starts really from this premise that you cannot have like uh, infinite growth on a finite planet. Uh, but I think as socialists, we also see growth as a bit more than just a system that is based on growth. Um, because um, we don't just focus on the relation between the bosses and the workers, which we call the ruling class and the working class, but also the relationship that there is between different companies and ruling classes. Um, so Marx called this a system that in which they are uh, locked in, a system of competitive accumulation. Um, so capitalists are uh, compelled to make growth, um, to make growth be profitable uh, because of the nature of capitalism itself. And competition derives from two elements of capitalism. And the first one is that workers are being exploited uh, in their work and they create more value for the capitalist. Uh, which the capitalists can sell. We call this surplus value, which is a central um, 
element within a Marxist economy. Um, and the other is that these capitalists are also forced to stay ahead because of the capitalist system. So if you fall behind, you kind of risk going bankrupt and uh, you will be uh, eaten up by your rifles, basically. So this surplus value and this continuous uh, exploitation of workers is needed uh, to be reinvested back into the economy um, to stay ahead of the game. So uh, often, um, I think with these reformist strategies, I think people also see the capitalist system as kind of an ideology, but it's, it's more than that. We can't opt out of it uh, because capitalism forces companies to compete with each other, um, yeah, which takes place uh, on the exploitation of the people on the planet. Um, but I do agree with you that there's often also misconceptions on degrowth um, and that it, all, that it would mean nothing more than austerity um, and that climate activists, uh, for example, just want the working class to consume less. Um, but I think also uh, different degrowth thinkers like uh, Matthias Schmelzer, Andrea Vetter and Aaron van Ischian in their recent also work argue that the vast majority of degrowth thinkers uh, also start from this premise that, like you said, we need to build a world uh, that is more equitable and equal. And degrowth is actually not about just cutting uh, the GP GDP and consuming less, but it um, yeah, vocalizes a need for a different economic system, uh, post-capitalist uh, world. Um, Yeah, and also, like you say, that um, there's a, the focus is not per se uh, with these thinkers on the global south, but that it should be an equal process and uh, class also takes into account. I've all, I think this is also, also a big misconception of degrowth, but I think the tension that there is within degrowth uh, theory that there's not actually a clear uh, pathway or idea um, how to get from capitalism to this post-capitalist, post-growth society. Um, there's often this focus on creating yeah, little islands uh, that offer this different way of production, alternative sharing economies, alternative food production, housing cooperatives. Um, and I think uh, they can offer an, uh, an alternative um, and show a way of how our societies could be organized. Oh. Um, but in the end of the day, they remain trapped by the market's logic uh, of competition and production for profit. And um, yeah, inhabitants or workers um, are reliant on external forces and also capitalism can organize to destroy them. So if they, if they go and uh, the interest of the companies um, gets too tense, um, it's they can easily be crushed by the system. And I think we also see, I see this also, for example, in the housing cooperative that I'm part of, uh, the bundle. Uh, so a lot of people uh, frame housing cooperatives as like, oh, revolutionary, because we're taking back um, a housing and building it for ourselves. And in some ways, it's, it's very interesting. I'm very happy to be part of the, this project. Um, it's a housing project in this neighborhood that's also an anti-gentrification um, um, yeah, project are very much based on getting um, people from inside this neighborhood, which is rapidly gentrifying inside our cooperative, and together we're building our community. Um, but at the end of the day, we're just, um, if the municipality or the banks decide to increase our loans by interest by 1%, we will fail. And we don't have any um, uh, place of power. We're not uh, organized in production places. We're just a random group of people who don't have any economic power uh, to actually um, fight against this um, in comparison to the working class, to workers. Uh, we're just a bit of a dispersed group of people uh, that is um, just, yeah, naar de pijpen aan het dansen van de gemeente, basically. So I think there are limitations in in these kind of uh, little islands within this uh, big capitalist city. Um, and I think often this, the, the strain of degrowth that you mentioned uh, is not based on a strategy to change the world fundamentally, uh, but offers uh, reforms to mitigate uh, the worst effects of capitalism. 
uh, like cutting down advertising, uh, the waste, etc. Um, and it's more focused on bringing the economy in balance, balance, um, and not overthrowing the whole system uh, per se. Mm. So, why I don't why I think we cannot reform our way out of the climate crisis is that, for example, um, Rosa Luxemburg also uh, talked about this in her work, um, Reform and Revolution. Uh, she stated that capitalism do whatever uh, it can to scale back on the reforms that we've won as a working class. And she said we should uh, yeah, str um, regard the struggle for reforms uh, in a manner that builds up working class power. And I think as socialists, uh, we should relate to the, str uh, to the struggle for reforms. We should uh, um, get behind it but, and not say, oh yeah, uh, fuck those little things that you can achieve as a working class, we only the revolution matters but we should use it as a struggle to build a more radical uh, climate movement, uh, an anti-capitalist movement. So, um, so as socialists, we support the struggle for these uh, yeah, reforms, but we should also try to put forward demands that question or expose the logic of uh, capitalism itself. And if we win it, they also mean real improvements. So for example, um, onteigening, expropriation uh, of companies that pollute without compensation uh, um, for the fossil uh, fuel industry, for example, free public transport, stopping fossil fuel su subsidies, things like this. Um, and I also think one of the um, key challenges or tensions that I see is that uh, within this school, there's not so much focus on the working class and the immense power that they have to um, actually um, yeah, build up a powerful movement to, um, to overthrow the system. And I think this neglect of the working class power and the focus of selling a vision um, also stems from the dominant character that I see within the climate movement. Um, so, um, recently, we also have this in our bookstore. Uh, uh, Matthew T. Huber wrote the book Climate Change as Class War. And he goes into this element that I, I think is really interesting uh, to relate to the cl uh, class character of the climate movement. But for the rest of the book, I strongly disagree with, with some elements. So I'm just using this one because I think we should really relate to the degrowth movement and really see also its value and also relates to yeah, critical anti-capitalist thinkers. Um, but I do think that what he describes is that there's an abundance of the professional class uh, within the climate movement that is active. Um, and as Marxists, we start uh, from a mat uh, materialist um, approach. We think that uh, the actions um, that we do every day also influence our ideas, uh, our daily actions determine how we view the world. So in his book, he states that a large part of the climate movement um, belongs to a separate layer of the working class, which he calls the professional class. I don't think it's a separate layer. I think it's a part of the working class, uh, but I do see, a, um, yeah, I do see uh, some truth in that. And the professional class is basically what he describes a growing group of workers who have studied and have a certain autonomy in their work. Uh, for example, managers, university staff, people working at NGOs, students. Um, and it's people who are re uh, removed far from production and uh, their work is more centered around knowledge production and distribution. And um, this group, and I see this also in the climate movement, um, approaches the climate crisis as uh, in a direction of science and facts and is often based on a strategy of persuasion and believing the science and selling an idea like degrowth. Um, and the idea is that not believing, for example, in the climate crisis is the biggest problem we are facing and if enough people would be informed, uh, more people would take action and be able to do so. And at a certain points, the ideas that our political leaders um, could no longer ignore the pressure of the system uh, of the people uh, and they would 
finally take action to implement a climate policy. Um, and often there's also this, this big focus on uh, technological and policy uh, changes within uh, that are proposed. And I think, for example, we can see this in different grassroots as well. Um, for example, Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future, they always uh, call out to listen to the science. And I think this is important, but it's, it's not the main problem that we have. I think the main problem uh, we're having when we talk about the climate crisis is that we have no control over production whatsoever. Uh, and this is uh, the problem, not per se, that not, not enough people believe in uh, the science. So, one minute? One minute? Oh. <laughs> Two. Uh, oh, Christine, I feel like I'm just up from the... Just go three? Okay. Um, so I think, think like, uh, um, like the new strain of contemporary deco thinkers and the solutions that they uh, propose um, that stem from this professional class uh, also come from this more theoretical world. Uh, which states that the lack of knowledge is a major problem um, because I think it also relates to the class character of the climate uh, uh, movement. Um, so what should we fight for, I think, uh, is um, a rational society uh, would be one of rising li living standards for workers everywhere. Um, but we need to change our priorities without the, the profit mo motive being involved. Um, but the question is more, uh, I think, attention with degrowth is um, how we actually achieve such a change. And uh, for Marx, the social for force to drive through such changes is the working class. And this is because of the role of workers uh, in labor producing, um, in in the labor market, um, and then, sorry, I'm kind of uh, trying to see how I'm gonna wrap up in how this such a, uh, two, two minutes, but, two minutes yeah. okay. Um, but I do think, like I said before, I think it's uh, wrong for us to dismiss uh, as revolutionary socialist, uh, as degrowth, as another form of austerity, as something that we should just throw out. I think it's attracted a lot of people in the last years that uh, are warming up to socialist ideas, anti-capitalist ideas, and we need to see a, a way of how to relate to this movement, and um, but also be really critical of this, its limitations. And I think its limitations can be summed up in yeah, often that there is this this uh, focus on uh, reform, which I just um, I don't. I think we need to be very clear about is that uh, in our struggle for reforms, yes, we we should struggle for them. We should cut advertising. We should cut the fossil fuel subsidies. But in itself, um, we should always work on building a fighting working class to to actually uh, get rid of the system that creates this growth for growth uh, system. Um, so, yeah, um, I think we need to have a discussion on that, how we can uh, unite these movements more together, uh, and um, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you, Noreen. Yeah.